Chapter Thirteen of the Promised Land. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. The Promised Land by Mary Anton. Chapter Thirteen. A Child's Paradise. All this while that I was studying and exploring in the borderland between the old life and the new, leaping at conclusions and sometimes slipping, finding inspiration in common things, and interpretations in dumb things, eagerly scaling the ladder of learning. My eyes on star diademed peaks of ambition, building up friendships that should support my youth and enrich my womanhood, learning to think much of myself and much more of my world, while I was steadily gathering in my heritage, sowed in the dim past and ripened in the sun of my own day. What was my sister doing? Why, what she had always done, keeping close to my mother's side, keeping close to my mother's side on the dreary marches of a humdrum life. Sensing sweet gardens of forbidden joy, but never turning from the path of duty, I cannot believe but that her sacrifices tasted as dust and ashes to her at times. For Frida was a mere girl whose childhood, on the whole, had been gray, while her appetite for happy things was as great as any normal girl's. She had a fine sense for what was best in the life about her, though she could not articulate her appreciation. She longed to possess the good things. But her position in the family forbidding possession, she developed a talent for vicarious enjoyment which I never in this life hoped to imitate, and her simple mind did not busy itself with self-analysis. She did not even know why she was happy. She thought life was good to her. Still, there must have been moments when she perceived that the finer things were not in themselves unattainable, but were kept from her by a social tyranny. This I can only surmise, as in our daily intercourse she never gave a sign of discontent. We continued to have a part of our life in common for some time after she went to work. We formed ourselves into an evening school, she and I and the two youngsters, for the study of English and arithmetic. As soon as the supper dishes were put away, we gathered around the kitchen table with books borrowed from school and pencils supplied by my father with eager willingness. I was the teacher, the others the diligent pupils, and the earnestness with which we labored was worthy of the great things we meant to achieve. Whether the results were commensurate with their efforts, I cannot say. I only know that Frieda's cheeks flamed with the excitement of reading English monosyllables, and her eyes shone like stars on a moonless night when I explained to her how she and I and George Washington were fellow citizens together. Inspired by our studious evenings, what Frieda Anton would not be glad to sit all day bent over the needle, that the family should keep on its feet and Mary continue at school. The morning ride on the ferry boat, when spring winds dimpled the river, may have stirred her heart with nameless longings. But when she took her place at the machine, her lot was glorified to her, and she wanted to sing. For the girls, the foreman, the boss, all talked about Mary Anton, whose poems were printed in an American newspaper. Wherever she went on her humble business, she was sure to hear her sister's name, for with characteristic loyalty, the whole Jewish community claimed kinship with me simply because I was a Jew, and they made much of my small triumphs and pointed to me with pride, just as they do when a Jew distinguishes himself in any worthy way. Frida, going home from work at sunset, when rosy buds beaded the shining stems, may have felt the weariness of those who toil for bread. But when we opened our books after supper, her spirit revived afresh, and it was only when the lamp began to smoke that she thought of taking rest. At bedtime, she and I chatted as we used to do when we were little girls in Polotsk. Only now, instead of closing our eyes to see imaginary wonders, according to a bedtime game of ours, we exchanged anecdotes about the marvelous adventures of our American life. My contributions on these occasions were boastful accounts, I have no doubt, of what I did at school, and in the company of school committeemen, editors, and other notables. And Frida's delight in my achievements was the very flower of her fine sympathy. As formerly, when I had been naughty and I invited her to share in my repentance, she used to join me in spiritual humility and solemnly dedicate herself to a better life. So now, when I was full of pride and ambition, She too felt the crown on her brows and heard the applause of future generations murmuring in her ear. And so, partaking of her sister's glory, what Frida Anton would not say that her portion was sufficient reward for a youth of toil. I did not, like my sister, earn my bread in those days, but let us say that I earned my salt by sweeping, scrubbing, and scouring on Saturdays when there was no school. 
My mother's housekeeping was necessarily irregular, as she was pretty constantly occupied in the store. So there was enough for us children to do to keep the bare room shining. Even here Frida did the lion's share. It used to take me all Saturday to accomplish what Frida would do with half a dozen turns of her capable hands. I did not like housework, but I loved order, so I polished windows with a will, and even got some fun out of scrubbing, by laying out the floor in patterns, and tracing them all around the room in a lively flurry of soap suds. There is a joy that comes from doing common things well, especially if they seem hard to us. When I faced a day's housework, I was half paralyzed with a sense of inability, and I wasted precious minutes walking around it, to see what a very hard task I had. But having pitched in and conquered, it gave me an exquisite pleasure to survey my work. My hair tousled, and my dress tucked up, streaked arms bare to the elbow, I would step on my heels over the damp, clean boards, and pass my hands over the chair rounds and table legs, to prove that no dust was left. I could not wait to put my dress in order, before running out into the street to see how my window shone. Every workman who carries a dinner-pail has these moments of keen delight in the product of his drudgery. Men of genius, likewise, in their hours of relaxation from their loftier tasks, prove this universal rule. I know a man who fills a chair at a great university. I have seen him hold a room of otherwise restless youths spellbound for an hour, while he discoursed about the respective inhabitants of the earth and sea at a time when nothing walked on fewer than four legs and I have seen this scholar, his ponderous tomes shelved for a space, turning over and over with cherishing hands a letter-box that he had made out of cardboard and paste, and exhibiting it proudly to his friends. For the hand was the first instrument of labor, that distinctive accomplishment by which man finally raised himself above his cousins, the lower animals, and a respect for the work of the hand survives as an instinct in all of us. The stretch of weeks from June to September, when the schools were closed, would have been hard to fill in, had it not been for the public library. At first I made myself a calendar of the vacation months, and every morning I tore off a day, and comforted myself with the decreasing number of vacation days. But after I discovered the public library, I was not impatient for the reopening of school. The library did not open till one o'clock in the afternoon, and each reader was allowed to take out only one book at a time. Long before one o'clock I was to be seen on the library steps, waiting for the door of paradise to open. I spent hours in the reading-room, pleased with the atmosphere of books, with the order and quiet of the place, so unlike anything on Arlington Street. The sense of these things permeated my consciousness, even when I was absorbed in a book, just as the rustle of pages turned and the tiptoe tread of the librarian reached my ear, without distracting my attention. Anything so wonderful as a library had never been in my life. It was even better than school in some ways. One could read and read, and learn and learn, as fast as one knew how, without being obliged to stop for stupid little girls, and inattentive little boys to catch up with the lesson. When I went home from the library, I had a book under my arm, and I would finish it before the library opened next day, no matter till what hours of the night I burned my little lamp. What books did I read so diligently? pretty nearly everything that came to my hand. I dare say the librarian helped me select my books. But curiously enough, I do not remember. Something must have directed me, for I read a great many of the books that are written for children. Of these I remember, with the greatest delight, Louisa Elcott's stories. A less attractive series of books was of the Sunday school type. In volume after volume, a very naughty little girl by the name of Lulu was always going into tempers, that her father might have opportunity to lecture her, and point to her angelic little sister, Gracie, as an example of what she should be, after which they all felt better and prayed. Next to Louisa Elcott's books, in my esteem, were boys' books of adventure, many of them by Horatio Elger, and I read all, I suppose, of the Rollo books, by Jacob Abbott. But that was not all. I read every kind of printed rubbish that came into the house, by design or accident. A weekly story-paper of a worse than worthless character, that circulated widely in our neighborhood because subscribers were rewarded with the premium of a diamond ring, warranted I don't know how many carats, occupied me for hours. The stories in this paper resembled, in breathlessness of plot, abundance of horrors, and improbability of characters, the things I used to read in Vitebsk. The text was illustrated by frequent pictures, in which the villain generally had his hands on the heroine's throat, while the hero was bursting in through a graceful drapery to the rescue of his beloved. 
If a bundle came into the house, wrapped in a stained old newspaper, I laboriously smoothed out the paper and read it through. I enjoyed it all, and found fault with nothing that I read. And, as in the case of the Vitebsk readings, I cannot find that I suffered any harm. Of course, reading so many better books, there came a time when the diamond ring story paper disgusted me. But in the beginning my appetite for print was so enormous that I could let nothing pass through my hands unread, while my taste was so crude that nothing printed could offend me. Good reading matter came into the house from one other source besides the library. The Yiddish newspapers of the day were excellent, and my father subscribed to the best of them. Since that time Yiddish journalism has sadly degenerated, through imitation of the vicious yellow journals of the American press. There was one book in the library over which I pored very often, and that was the encyclopedia. I turned usually to the names of famous people, beginning, of course, with George Washington. Oftenest of all, I read the biographical sketches of my favorite authors, and felt that the worthies must have been glad to die just to have their names and histories printed out in the Book of Fame. It seemed to me the apotheosis of glory to be even briefly mentioned in an encyclopedia, and there grew in me an enormous ambition that devoured all my other ambitions, which was no less than this, that I should live to know that after my death my name would surely be printed in the encyclopedia. It was such a prodigious thing to expect that I kept the idea a secret even from myself, just letting it lie where it sprouted, in an unexplored corner of my busy brain. But it grew on me in spite of myself, till finally I could not resist the temptation to study out the exact place in the encyclopedia where my name would belong. I saw that it would come not far from Elcott, Louisa M., and I covered my face with my hands to hide the silly, baseless joy in it. I practiced saying my name in the encyclopedic form, Anton, Mary, and I realized that it sounded chopped off, and wondered if I might not annex a middle initial. I wanted to ask my teacher about it, but I was afraid I might betray my reasons. For, infatuated though I was with the idea of greatness I might live to attain, I knew very well that thus far my claims to posthumous fame were ridiculously unfounded, and I did not want to be laughed at for my vanity. Spirit of all childhood, forgive me, forgive me, for so lightly betraying a child's dream secrets, I that smile so scoffingly to-day at the unsophisticated child that was myself. Have I found any nobler thing in life than my own longing to be noble? Would I not rather be consumed by ambitions that can never be realized than live in stupid acceptance of my neighbor's opinion of me? The statue in the public square is less a portrait of a mortal individual than a symbol of the immortal aspiration of humanity. So do not laugh at the little boy playing at soldiers if he tells you how he is going to hew the world into good behavior when he gets to be a man. And do, by all means, write my name in the Book of Fame, saying, She was one who aspired, for in that condensed form is the story of the lives of the great. Summer days are long, and the evenings we know are as long as the lampwick. So with all my reading I had time to play, and with all my studiousness I had the will to play. My favorite playmates were boys. It was but mild fun to play theater in Bessie Finkelstein's backyard, even if I had leading parts, which I made impressive by recitations in Russian, no word of which was intelligible to my audience. It was far better sport to play hide-and-seek with the boys, for I enjoyed the use of my limbs— what there was of them, I was so often reproached and teased for being little that it gave me great satisfaction to be a five-foot boy to the goal. Once a great hulky colored boy, who was the torment of the neighborhood, treated me roughly while I was playing on the street. My father, determined to teach the rascal a lesson for once, had him arrested and brought to court. The boy was locked up overnight, and he emerged from his brief imprisonment with a respect for the rights and persons of his neighbors but the moral of this incident lies not herein. What interested me more than my revenge on a bully was what I saw of the way in which justice was actually administered in the United States. Here we were gathered in the little courtroom, bearded Arlington Street against wool-headed Arlington Street, accused and accuser, witnesses, sympathizers, sightseers, and all. Nobody cringed, nobody was bullied, nobody lied who didn't want to. We were all free, and all treated equally, just as it said in the Constitution. The evildoer was actually punished, and not the victim, as might very easily happen in a similar case in Russia. Liberty and justice for all. Three cheers for the red, white, and blue. 
There was one occasion in the week when I was ever willing to put away my book, no matter how entrancing were its pages. That was on Saturday night, when Bessie Finkelstein called for me, and Bessie and I, with arms entwined, called for Sadie Rabinovich, and Bessie and Sadie and I, still further entwined, called for Annie Riley, and Bessie, etc., etc., inextricably wound up, marched up Broadway, and took possession of all we saw, heard, guessed, or desired, from end to end of that main thoroughfare of Chelsea. Parading all abreast, as many as we were, only breaking ranks to let people pass, leaving the imprints of our noses and fingers on plate-glass windows ablaze with electric lights, and alluring with display, inspecting tons of cheap candy, to find a few pennies worth of the most enduring kind, the same to be sucked and chewed by the company, turn and turn about, as we continued our promenade, loitering wherever a crowd gathered, or running for a block or so, to cheer on the fire-engine or police ambulance, getting into everybody's way, and just keeping clear of serious mischief. We were only girls. We enjoyed ourselves as only children can, whose fathers keep a basement grocery store, whose mothers do their own washing, and whose sisters operate a machine for five dollars a week. Had we been boys, I suppose Bessie and Sadie and the rest of us would have been a gang, and would have popped into the Chinese laundry to tease Chinky Chinaman, and been chased by the cops from comfortable doorsteps, and had a bully time of it. Being what we were, we called ourselves a set, and we had a lovely time, as people who passed us on Broadway could not fail to see, and hear. For we were at the giggling age, and Broadway on Saturday night was full of giggles for us. We stayed out till all hours, too, for Arlington Street had no strict domestic program, not even in the nursery, the inmates of which were as likely to be found in the gutter as in their cots, at any time this side of one o'clock in the morning. There was an element in my enjoyment that was yielded neither by the sights, the adventures, nor the chewing candy. I had a keen feeling for the sociability of the crowd. All plebeian Chelsea was abroad, and a bourgeois population is nowhere unneighborly. Women shapeless with bundles, their hats awry over thin, eager faces, gathered in knots on the edge of the curb, boasting of their bargains. Little girls in curl papers and little boys in brimless hats clung to their skirts, whining for pennies, only to be silenced by absent-minded cuffs. A few disconsolate fathers strayed behind these family groups, the rest being distributed between the barber shops and the corner lamp posts. I understood these people, being one of them, and I liked them, and I found it all delightfully sociable. Saturday night is the workman's wife's night. But that does not entirely prevent my lady from going abroad, if only to leave an order at the florist's. So it happened that Bellingham Hill and Washington Avenue, the aristocratic sections of Chelsea, mingled with Arlington Street on Broadway, to the further enhancement of my enjoyment of the occasion. For I always loved a mixed crowd. I loved the contrasts, the high lights and deep shadows, and the gradations that connect the two and make all life one. I saw many, many things that I was not aware of seeing at the time. I only found out afterwards what treasures my brain had stored up. When coming to the puzzling places in life, light and meaning would suddenly burst on me, the hidden fruit of some experience that had not impressed me at the time. How many times, I wonder, did I brush past my destiny on Broadway, foolishly staring after it, instead of going home to pray? I wonder, did a stranger collide with me, and put me patiently out of his way, wondering why such a mite was not at home and abed at ten o'clock in the evening, and never dreaming that one day he might have to reckon with me? Did someone smile down on my childish glee, I wonder, unwarned of a day when we should weep together? I wonder, I wonder, a million threads of life and love and sorrow was the common street, and whether we would or not, we entangled ourselves in a common maze without paying the homage of a second glance to those who would some day master us. Too dull to pick that face from out the crowd which one day would bend over us in love or pity or remorse. What company of skipping, laughing little girls is to be reproached for careless hours, when men and women on every side stepped heedlessly into the traps of fate? Small sin it was to annoy my neighbor by getting in his way, as I stared over my shoulder. If a grown man knew no better than to drop a word in passing that might turn the course of another's life, as a boulder rolled down from the mountainside deflects the current of a brook. End of chapter 13